Welcome to the Saturday edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. To hope you're going to stay with us throughout the show. We have two interviews lined up for you and the first one being uh, medically related. We're going to be talking pelvic floor damage with a urologist and later on in the show we're going to talk about the Utba Wellness Centre based in Indonesia and it's a centre for females only. But right now, urology and uh, I guess when we're talking pelvic floor damage, it is really an issue around women and women's health. In studio, we have a Dr. Mamitele, Dr. Craig Mamitele. He is a urologist based at the Urology Hospital in Pretoria. Good morning, welcome to the program. Morning and thank you for the invite. Well, I'm really excited to have you here because what you've just told me off air mm -hmm. um, says a lot about your hospital and the medical professionals working there. Um, I was quite blown away when you said that the urology hospital in Pretoria, where you practice from, is the only one, in, one of its kind in Africa, the entire Africa. Yes, it is. It is. Um, actually, um, yeah, we, we're the only one. We boast with, I think, we're about 24 urologists and other supporting uh, disciplines as well. We have surgeon, um, the intensivist, even a gyne as well. We have physiotherapists as well who are working there and obviously the nursing staff as well, the specialized nursing staff. So how long have you guys been operating from Pretoria? I think last week or, last week or this week, the hospital 10, 22 years. Um, of existence and um, another thing that we pride ourselves we're the first one to bring a robot in Africa to operate with a robot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's 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 just an amazing achievement and really good to know that we here in South Africa can boast a first like this and of mm -hmm. course um, we are now part of the global village I should imagine that we are on par with any other hospital anywhere in the world as far as the discipline that you offer yes 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 um, if you look at what we do it's exactly on par even the international specialists they come and, um, and present on with with us or they invite some of our surgeons to go uh, present uh, overseas so I will share knowledge and experiences on what we do as well. okay for the purposes of today's program we're going to be talking pelvic floor damage mm. and immediately it suggests to me it's a female problem yes. would I be correct in thinking that it is uh, most of the time uh, probably it's very rare personally I've never seen a male with a pelvic organ prolapse so the pelvic floor damage, we, the medical term that we use is pelvic, pelvic floor prolapse. So what basically it means is that the organs which are in the pelvis, they protrude through the vagina. So in a maid, if you look at what we have in a maid, there's only one orifice. Uh, it's actually two. The other one is through the penis. The other one is through the rectum. In a female, there's the urethra, which is very short, and the vagina and the rectum. So the vagina, that's where most of the prolapse happens. So the condition affects mostly women and it's very rare in males. Is it because women bear children and would that be one of possibly the side effects to giving birth and that perhaps at some stage in your life you'll be presenting with a pelvic floor damage or are there other issues at play here? All right, um, pregnancy is the most the risk factor that we see, which is mostly common in women, especially with vaginal delivery. So if you were to compare the vaginal delivery and caesarean section, uh, the risk increases more with the vaginal delivery, especially if you're going to have more than one kid. We call it multiparous women as well. So, But there are other things which, which are at play as well. 
So women, as we know, that they go through menopause. When they go through menopause, you get your ovaries not working, and then you don't produce enough estrogen. So what estrogen normally does, it keeps your, your tissues very healthy and very strong. So the minute you go through menopause, they become a bit lax and then lose a bit. So it's all women, sadly, women that are plagued with all of these issues. Yeah, most of the time it is. Um, as I've explained the anatomy, um, so they have areas which can herniate, the pelvic organs, they can herniate. Um, if you look at the human being, so the pelvic floor, that's what holds everything uh, when you're standing in terms of gravity. So if there's a bit of a hole there, a weakness, so things will start coming out. So um, other risk factors besides pregnancy itself, it will be anything which can increase intra-abdominal pressure. For example, if you suffer from constipation, oh. and then if you have what we call chronic uh, pulmonary airway disease, uh, asthma or COPD, the chronic smokers, they get that. And then in rare cases, we have patients with uh, uh, connective tissue diseases, like Marfan's disease, where they are, they are their connective tissues are very lax, their ligaments are very lax. Those would be those people who do funny things and bend their arms the other way around. So if you're a woman and you're, you're capable of that with Marfan's disease, you're more likely your, 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 your ligaments, which are supposed to hold your pelvic organs, they can lapse as well. So it's pregnancy, menopause, anything which can increase intra-abdominal pressure and connective tissue diseases which are congenital. And does pregnant women ever present with problems? I'm assuming a woman has had one or a couple of babies naturally. Mm -hmm. um, should she be taking extra precautions with her future pregnancies in terms of pelvic floor damage? All right. So if you look at what was happening before and now, um, there are certain conditions when, when you are pregnant and you go to a gynae, they would assess and measure the size of your child, how big your child is, to mitigate the problems of being, having what we call uh, CPD, cephalo pelvic disproportion. That means uh, the head of a child is too big or the child is too big to pass through the birth canal normally. So if you force and you, don't, you are not prepared accordingly, these are some of the risks which are going to happen later in life. So if your gynae or your obstetrician says that, they would advise you it's better we do a caesarean section because if you want to do a normal delivery, it may, you may have problems and then later. They may not come now, but the risk increases in the next five to 10 years. And it gets worse when you get to menopause because now with the low estrogen and your tissues starting to get lax, your things get worse as well. Then you may have prolapse. Okay, and I suppose that's one of the reasons why we're seeing more and more seizures being performed these days, but we'll mm. address that after the ad break. Mm. Uh, Dr. Mami Tele is in studio with me. He is talking about urological issues. He's from the urology hospital based in Pretoria, one of its kind, the only one in the whole of Africa, and they obviously specialize in urological issues. Don't go away, we'll be back talking more about urology and other related matters. We have Dr. Mamitele from the Urology Hospital in Pretoria talking to us about urological issues. We are going to focus in this part of the interview on pelvic floor damage, but other issues will be touched on as well. I'm wondering why am I talking to you about childbirth, pelvic floor damage, caesareans, natural births, etc., as opposed to a gynecologist? Okay. So in our specialty with the blood, with, with the gynes, we share a certain area which is almost like a gray zone. Um, but during our training, we have uh, meetings where we meet and then we discuss the same thing. Um, what we always, when we joke about, we say the bladder belongs to us. So even if it protrudes through the genitals of a female, it's still ours. 
and then anything which is belongs to the genital females it's a, the kindness they want to own it as well but it's a gray zone we both trained in it and it also depends on a surgical surgeon how comfortable they they are in in treating those conditions because at some point you choose whether you enjoy doing that part or you focus focus on other conditions as well before the ad break, I asked you about, you suggested that women who have multiple babies, mm -hmm. perhaps um, they need to assess whether they're going to have natural birth or go for the Caesar route. Mm -hmm. Would you comfortably say that perhaps Caesars are better options because of all of these side effects that we're seeing? All right. So it, it's not to suggest that everyone needs to go for a Caesarean section. What, it, what needs to happen, you need to have an obstetrician who's going to take you through the journey and advise you. And even after, if, let's say you've had multiple pregnancies, as you get older and older and you go through menopause, there's what we call, because of the low estrogen that you get, there's what we call hormone replacement therapy. Of course. So we can replace that estrogen so that we keep your, uh, your pelvic floor uh, um, uh, healthy. And, and, and matured. Another thing that we do, um, we use the physiotherapist. Um, they can teach you how to strengthen the pelvic floor. So basically the pelvic floor, it, uh, the supporting structures, it's mainly the muscles and the fascias. The fascias are the ligaments that are there. So with the muscles, they are the integral part. So a physio can help with pelvic, pelvic floor exercises, keep them healthy, and stronger and then you may avoid having all these problems later in life. As a matter of cause and common sense, would you mm. advise women uh, even pre and post having their babies to perhaps do those exercises to ensure good health going forward? Yes, yes, yes. That, 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 that is spot on because uh, prevention is better than cure. Mm -hmm. When we start operating, remember now, we're trying to reconstruct. And if things are done properly and you strengthen your pelvic floor, you won't have much of a problems later in life. I think you're quite well aware that uh, cancers in children seems to be on the rise and in general right across the board. Yes. Uh, people, it's, it's, it's almost as if it's, you know, the disease of the 21st century. Mm. Are you seeing more and more cancers as far as urology is concerned and how would they present? Right, we are seeing a lot of cancers um, in our specialty um, in South African statistics. Breast cancer and cervical cancer, in terms of females, is the leading one. With us, it's prostate cancer in males. So, one of the things it's still debatable on why we're seeing the increases, whether it's because um, our health system now is starting to improve, we're screening more patients, and there's better access to everyone, even those who are disadvantaged. It could be that as well. Um, but in any case, globally, there is an increase. Whether it's all the radiation that we are getting exposed to, the increase in the Western life of living, increasing uh, the diet that we take, and, and the lack of exercising as well, all those things, they contribute. Even the other things which um, they're also investigating is the pesticides, how our fruits are prepared and things like that. All these things, when they accumulate, they can cause what we call carcinogens, and then they can increase the chances of cancer. So that can happen in almost all the departments in, in the body. Um, they, we, we certainly seeing all the increases. And smoking as well. Uh, more people are, more, are smoking. Um, younger kids as well, women also are smoking, so it also increases the carcinogens in your body, so we are more likely to see more cancers. When we talk about the pelvic floor and the health of the pelvic floor, mm. um, are you seeing cancers in that area as well? Or are there other symptoms and signs that um, people, women especially, should be looking out for? You've indicated how it presents, and mm. I'm wondering about the discomfort and pain perhaps that's associated with it. All right, so with pelvic floor prolapse, there's two ways of presenting. Most of the patients, depending on the degree of the prolapse, if it's minor prolapse like grade one and grade two, usually it's still almost on the internal part of it. 
So that means the organs, they've just prolapsed a bit. They're not going outside the introitus or the, um, the vagina. It's not going outside, excuse the language, but it's not going outside the external genitalia. So those patients, they won't feel anything. They won't see anything. They may have a feeling, a heavy feeling down there, but they would, they would ignore it most of the time. So those who pre, the ones who present are those when things are getting worse. So what it means um, <clears throat> is that when the bladder prolapses in front and then it starts also pulling the urethra, the outlet, it starts causing obstructive symptoms in when you urinate. And then the more you keep urine in your blood and you can urinate fully, you get recurrent infections. When the vagina prolapses, the inside of it or the uterus itself coming out, um, it starts getting dry, it becomes painful. Even when you want to engage um, with intercourse, it gets painful. And then on the back side of the vagina is the rectum. If that part of the rectum also prolapses into oh. the vagina, you have problems with uh, defecation as well. So you also have that feeling that you need to go and because you're not emptying fully as well. And then you get more of your stools getting impacted and then getting more um, constipation as well. And lots of discomfort and possibly of pain as well. Yes. Now you spoke about, we talking obviously pelvic f uh, floor uh, prolapse. Mm. How is that different to a bladder prolapse? Because I know a lot of women probably go to have it lifted yes. because they're very uncomfortable and uh, you know experience everything that you've just outlined now mm. is it similar is it different and when you're having um, you know when you're having the operation to correct it no. um, could you kind of do the two together yes. the pelvic floor and the bladder yes so what what normally happens just to um, there are pictures that will show um, on the anterior part, that would be anterior part, it's, it's the bladder in a female. So the central part that we're talking about will be the vagina. On the anterior part is the bladder. So if most of the prolapse is from the anterior, it will be the bladder prolapsing. If it's more at the apical, at the top, it will be the uterus. If you don't have the uterus, we'll, we'll call it the enterocell. From the back, it will be the rectocell. It's the rectum prolapsing. So depending. If the whole pelvic floor is loose, everything can come down. The bladder, the, the, the apical, the uterus, even the rectum. So whenever we, 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 we evaluate, before we operate, we want to check all those things. And another thing, um, it's, it's to help you and, and let you know that this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna re repair the anterior part, the posterior part, Sometimes if we think everything is too much, it's better to even open from the abdominal side and pull everything and anchor it through the abdomen. But nowadays it's even much easier. We can do laparoscopy or robotic assisted where we don't need to make a big scar to open you up. With few incisions, we put in instruments and put in a mesh. We can lift everything and then put it back into position as well. And recovery time for a procedure like this, because it does sound like a big procedure. Yes. So oh, um, when we talk laparoscopy, that means um, it's less minimal in, invasion. It's minimally inv invasive, and um, it's 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 less hospital time and quick recovery than when we open. Because when we open, we have to go through the muscles, and muscles the long the the, the when you age, it takes longer to get healed. So that means longer recovery. So to open, we go through muscles, but when we do minimal invasive, it's small holes, and then we just operate through there. And success rate? Uh, success rate, it's all about making the correct operation and the correct diagnosis. So in most of the time, before we even operate, um, we have to look at a couple of things. We have to look at also when we repair the bladder, because the bladder in women it's, it's, it's very linked to the urethra. So we want to check whether when we lift it, will it make you leak urine later in life so that in the same time we fix the two. Through the vagina, we have to check if you're having what we call vaginal atrophy. So vaginal atrophy, if we're gonna put in a mesh, 
uh, in your vagina it's atrophied that means now the lining of the vagina is very thin it's not that bulky the healing it won't be that nice and then you are more likely to get complications and then we have to make sure that you're not constipated and um, with all that and your general health as well if you're diabetic and things like that we won't operate you when your sugar is not controlled and things like that. so the couple of things which we look at no so easy that, answers <laughs> no easy answers but the success rate is good as long as the correct diet diagnosis is made and the correct procedure is done. Okay, let's go for another ad break. We'll be back talking some more about urological problems. Dr. Mamitele is my guest and of course we're going to talk some more after the ad break. Craig Mamitele from the Urology Hospital in Pretoria is here talking about uh, pelvic floor prolapse and of course we're going to touch on one or two other issues around that area of the anatomy. Now Craig, um, I'm wondering, you know, as you've been outlining throughout the discussion, mm. you talk about older women, you talk about women in the menopausal years. Yes. Um, is that suggesting that uh, pelvic floor prolapse really does occur mainly in older women? What about younger women who may have had one or two pregnancies, still possibly in their late 20s or early 30s, want to still go on and have more babies, but they have this problem? If and when they undergo the procedure, what is the prognosis for future babies, future pregnancies in that young woman? All right, so in younger women, when we see them, usually their tissues are still, uh, they don't suffer from vaginal atrophy and things <laughs> like course. that. So um, we avoid using mesh. So in elderly patients, sometimes when, you, when the tissues are too lax and you think that it's gonna recur, we use a mesh so that it helps to hold the tissues together. So if someone is still planning to have more babies, you won't use that. Um, in some instances, we cover the whole uterus with the mesh to hold it up. So you can't cover the... In older women? In, in younger patients. Okay. So it, it, remember when we operate, it's either we use the normal tissues and we just strengthen them by just reattaching them. Or we use a, a mesh so that will help the tissues to hold. But she's still able to have future pregnancies, babies? In, in, in younger patients, yes. we avoid using a mesh. Okay. We can use the, the tissue repairs. But that comes with the risk that when you are pregnant, you are more likely it, it may recur. Because when a child grows, you're increasing abdominal pressures. You're putting more strain to the pelvic organ, uh, pelvic floor. So it can recur in younger patients. So would that be the type of patient whom you would suggest to have a Caesar? It would suggest to have a Caesar, but the most of the time would tell them, depending on the grade, if it's a low grade, would we'll not do anything. You wait for them to finish their, to do their family planning. And then when they are done, then you advise them that from now on, um, you need to, con you need to avoid pregnancies because your condition is going to get worse and worse and worse. Even though she opts then to have a future pregnancy and the delivery through yeah. a cesarean section. Yes. Remember, it's still a risk. It's still a risk because that baby is heavy on the pelvic floor. Remember the pelvic floor holds everything up, uh, which, which is supposed to go down with gravity. We've talked about certain risks throughout the show. What other risks have we not touched on as far as this procedure is concerned? Um, you mean in terms of complications? Yes, of, complications uh, and so risks. The, the, the complications that we normally see, it's, it's mesh erosion, the recurrence as well. So if you have someone who keeps on smoking, remember smoking does a lot of damage to the body. Um, it also damages your ligaments. It makes them lax. If you continue smoking, and then the weight as well. The more you gain weight, the more you're putting pressure on your pelvic floor, you're more likely to get that. Your constipation, if it gets worse as well, you're more likely. And if your chest issues, if you keep on coughing and things like that, it also puts pressure. Because every time you cough, you're increasing the intra-abdominal pressures. So things like that will make it to have recurrence or it increases the failure rate. 
And have you seen um, pelvic floor prolapse in men? I know you said it's very rare, mm. uh, but what does that success rate look like? Um, in, in, in males, it's not that common. Um, the ones that have been reported most is rectal prolapses. Usually it's handled by the surgeons. There's usually an underlying cause to that. It, it, it doesn't just happen. Um, it will be maybe with uh, some connective tissue diseases and then um, the surgeons will probably have ways and means of operating it. I don't have any experience in my short career with a male with a pelvic organ prolapse, but um, I've heard of rectal prolapses, but it's not in my specialty. We've talked very widely about pelvic floor damage or mm. prolapse as far as women are concerned, very especially older women. What else do we know or need to know about this problem? You also indicated that um, undergoing um, an exercise regime to strengthen your pelvic floor is also a very good idea, very mm. especially in your early years of life so that you're strong and healthy later on in life. Yes. Um, you also spoke about uh, hormone replacement therapy, mm -hmm. but that too comes with, it, uh, with its own side effects and yes, risks. Yes, yes. With, with hormone replacement, before we even start it, we have to look at your risk factors as well for, what we, uh, for things like clotting, uh, deep venous thrombosis before we give you, and the risk of breast cancer as well. So whoever, that, whoever starts you on that treatment, they will assess that. Another important thing is eating healthy and not avoiding to gaining excessive weight because that puts pressure on your pelvic Absolutely. floor. So weight and the diet is very important. We've talked largely about women and the urological issues, very especially mm. uh, pelvic floor damage. Mm. What are men presenting with as far as um, the um, discipline of urology is concerned? What's the most common uh, mm. urological problems um, that men are presenting with? So men, um, <clears throat> Uh, usually when I do my teaching presentations, I say life begins at 40. Ah. <laughs> uh, from the age of 40, there are some men who start reporting erectile dysfunction. And then um, prostate problems, prostate starts growing around that age. And then even cancers of the prostate, they start increasing. And then bladder cancer as well. And then there are also other problems, kidney problems. Um, especially kidney, uh, recurrent kidney infection, kidney stones, and also kid kidney cancers as well. How dramatic or serious should one take the problem of kidney stones? Kidney stones usually, as, as in the past few days, we've been having a heat wave in, in, uh -huh. in Gauteng. So the more you dehydrated, your urine gets concentrated. When things are concentrated, you are more likely to form stones. So keeping, making sure that you're well hydrated, drinking enough fluid, it helps to mitigate the, 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 the stone formation. So it is a problem in summer, especially white people, black people, everyone. It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't discriminate. When we talk rehydration, it's mm -hmm. not only, I mean, there's certain healthcare professionals who absolutely insist you need to drink eight glasses of water a day, but you could be having your liquids in any form, juices, teas, coffees, etc. or is that a no-no as far as you're concerned? Uh, so it depends as well. Some people like coffee. Personally, me, coffee makes my bladder to be irritated. It <laughs> makes me to go to the loo more often. So it depends from person to person. Some patients, they have what we call oxalate stones. Tea has oxalate, so you may form more stones if you drink more tea. But drinking water, it's usually the best thing. Another important thing about water in women, um, the more you drink water, you're helping, let's say you suffer from recurrent infection. If in fact you can flush out those in bacteria in your bladder by drinking more fluid and going to the loo more often before they settle and cause a serious bladder infection. So it has advantages to drink fluid. What I tell my patients is that when you go to the loo and your urine is very yellow or dark yellow, that means you're not drinking enough. So your urine should be light, slightly yellow to clear and then you know you're drinking enough. Okay, to wrap up then, what else do we need to ensure both as young males, females and also older people mm -hmm. in terms of a healthy uh, pelvic region 
um, so that we don't suffer discomfort, pain and inconvenience as we go through life. All right. So the first thing, as we talked about, the, 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 the fluids is very important. And then um, to go should for we screening. Be, sorry for the interruption. Mm. Should we be, are there specific investigations or consults that older people, or perhaps even young people, should be undergoing maybe once a year, once in two years, just to check that everything is okay, apart from going for your pap smear and your mammo and your regular gynecological uh, checkup. Is there anything else you would suggest we do just to ensure general health and well-being? And most of the time when you go through a pap smear, they will examine you. And then that's an opportunity. If you have some kind of a symptom you're not sure about, don't keep quiet. Talk to every healthcare provider that is seeing you and helping you with a pap smear. And then they will quickly check. And then if they're not sure as well, they can send you to a specialist to go consult and then men are the problems they don't consult the female part of it it's much better females they do consult men True. they don't consult <laughs> i've had instances when whenever they come in um there should be someone maybe a celebrity who had the problem and then everyone just gets scared for that time and all of a sudden it dies down when kolani kuala had that rectal cancer he's still having it is He's in remission at the moment, yeah. thank God. So we had a lot of men consulting, wanted to know, am I fine, am I fine? When Prahu Masikela had prostate cancer, died of prostate cancer, with a couple of uh, guys coming in and coming to check. But what we advise patients is that from the age of 40, have your prostate get checked. That's for men, obviously. That's for me. During that consultation, it's always advisable to talk about your sexual functioning. The reason is, most of the men who get erectile dysfunction around the age of 40, it's usually an underlying symptoms for more bigger things. Ah. It's all about the, the blood supply to the pelvic organ. So if that blood supply is reduced, you're more likely to get uh, problems with erectile dysfunction. The same blood vessels are the same size blood vessels which are found in the heart in the brain and also in the eyes and in the kidneys. So they're also affected. So it's a sign which can um, expose other problems that you're more likely to find. So in some studies, they suggest that if the minute you start reporting erectile dysfunction, you're at risk of getting a heart attack or a stroke. So don't take it lightly. Don't put it to aging. It may be a symptom of an underlying problem. So serious indeed. Yes. And that is where we have to end the show. Thank you so much for being in. You certainly have educated us okay. as far as uh, urology is concerned. And hopefully we can get together again sometime soon. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity Mark once Lee more. That was Dr. Craig Mamitele. He's from the Urology Hospital in Pretoria. He is a urolo urologist himself, talking to us about uh, pelvic floor damage or prolapse and other issues related to that part of the body. And on that note then, we wrap up the show this morning. Jazakallah for being with us. And as always, um, don't forget to take it easy on the roads and a big thank you to the production team. Till the next time, as always, it is Assalamu Alaikum and Khudafis from me, Julie Ali. Yeah,